bad. Good morning, men. I want to tell you about my wife. This is serious, fellas. <laughs> my wife is my hero. I am a follower of Jesus Christ because my wife is responsible for leading me to faith. She is the person who's had more influence on my life than anyone else. And uh, as a matter of fact, I admire her more than any other person in the whole world. She has the gift of mercy, and I am astonished to hear back reports from people where she'll send them, send them a little note of encouragement, or some woman uh, needed a ride to chemotherapy, and Patsy drove her, and she never tells me about any of this. I can't even fish it out of her. She just does this. This is her vocation. She's the Mother Teresa of my home. So I just couldn't understand why she wouldn't let me get a Harley. <laughs> for those of you who have been coming here for a while, you know that last November, after about a year of asking for a Harley, my wife gave me a green plant for my birthday instead of a green Harley that I asked for. And she thought that was so funny. <laughs> well, you know, I got to thinking about that in the couple of weeks following, and I, I realized that I'd never really surrendered this to the Lord. I'd never even really prayed and asked the Lord to either change Patsy's mind or change mine because I had made the decision that I would not do this thing unless she blessed it, not just permission. You know, there's a difference between giving permission and then blessing something because we've been married a long time. And guys, if you've been married a long time, one way to stay married a long time is to do things where you have the blessing of each other rather than kind of going off and forcing the issues. So anyway... It occurred to me one day, maybe I should pray about this and ask the Lord once and for all. I just kind of said, okay, I'm not going to worry about this anymore. I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to turn it over to God. And uh, if the Lord would allow me, and of course a motorcycle of any kind is, is, a, is a diversion and a recreational thing. It's certainly anything you need. Well, maybe. Anyway, um, <laughs> you think you do at the time, you know, but it's just in the category you want. So I turned this over to the Lord. And the most amazing thing happened. Two days later, I'm walking through the living room, and out of the clear blue, Patsy says, you know, I think it'd be okay. That'd be okay if you want to get a motorcycle. I said, well, Patsy, I don't want to do it if it's just okay. She said, no, no, no. I, 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 I want you to go ahead and do that because that's something you really want to do. So... Now, the hard part is going to be to figure out how to work this in as a segue into the talk this morning. <laughs> but I have a plan. What I want to talk to you about this morning is contentment. <laughs> and I must tell you that I am today embarrassingly content. 
But you know, I was embarrassingly content for those two days if the answer was going to be no as well. And I think there's something here to be learned for all of us when we have things that we want to do, and, um, and that's going to be the object of what we talk about this morning. Now, next week, you will not want to miss next week, because next week I'm going to tell you the story of how this purchase came about and the relationship that developed and what happened with the man who helped me uh, purchase the motorcycle from the store. It's a, it's a very uh, touching and fascinating story. So that'll be next week when we'll be doing John chapter 4. This morning, we're in John chapter 3. And the question is, as we begin, are you content? Are you content? Uh, this passage begins at John chapter 3, verse 22. And a few historical details are given, which we're not going to really look at. That's not the object of the message this morning. What I want to do is begin at verse 26. Speaking of John's disciples, John the Baptist's disciples, the scripture reads, they came uh, to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man speaking of Jesus, who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, well, he is baptizing and everyone's going to him. Now watch John's response. This is fascinating. To this John replied, a man can receive only what is given him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but I'm sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. Giving a little analogy here. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and is now complete. He must become greater. I must become less. John is embarrassingly content at this point. He has a joy, and he says this joy that he has is complete, and he's in the process of losing his vocation. He has chosen to be content with his role, and I want us to look at three questions this morning. Why is John so content. Why don't more Christians talk like this? Why don't more of us talk like this? And then what can we do to be a little more like John? So first question, why is John so content with who he is? John is so content with who he is because he is so confident of who Jesus is. Look at this next two or three verses. Verse 31. The one who comes, so now he's explaining, really, he's saying, you know, this is the explanation of why he feels like a man can receive only what he's been given from heaven. This is the explanation why he says he must become greater, I must become less. He says, the one who comes from above is above all. The one who, that's Jesus, the one who is from the earth belongs to the earth, that's him, and speaks as one from the earth. And then he repeats it, the one who comes from heaven is above all. John's going to show us three things here. And the first thing he's going to show us, that Jesus is the incarnation of deity. He's going to show us that, G he's showing us that Jesus, he believes that Jesus is the incarnation of deity. And then he's going to show us that Jesus, in his opinion, is the proclamation of veracity. And then we're going to see that Jesus has the delegation of authority. Look at this 32nd verse. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. The man who has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. And watch this. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God. Jesus speaks the words of God. It is the proclamation of veracity. And then look up at verse 35. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. 
the Father loves the Son and has put everything he has into the hands of Jesus. It is the delegation of authority. So there you have it. He believes, he is utterly convinced, he is totally confident, he is unshakable, he is utterly and absolutely sure that Jesus is the incarnation of deity, that he is making the proclamation of veracity, and he has the full delegation of authority. And look what kind of authority he has. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoa! But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. This is the most powerful person who's ever walked the face of the earth. No one has ever had this kind of power before. And John understands this. And so as this powerful Jesus is accelerating in his ministry, he's content with his place in life. It's okay with John. How many of you have ever been in the presence of someone who is truly a great person? Anybody in the presence of a, a truly great person? A few of you have been. People like a Mother Teresa or something. Well, C.S. Lewis, I just heard this story yesterday, and I'm on a C.S. Lewis kick this year, and I've read everything he's written Christian-wise this year. But apparently there's a biography about him, and in this biography it states, and I haven't verified this personally yet, I just heard this yesterday. But it states that C.S. Lewis would invite guests over for dinner parties and social gatherings, which, you know, back in the 50s and, you know, in the 40s, you didn't do much movie going and things like that. You know, a lot of stay-at-home kinds of things used to go on. And after dinner, they would play a game. And Lewis would invite one of his guests to go into his library and pick off the shelf any book, open it to any page, and begin reading. And he would say, read as much as you want, and when you want, stop reading. So the guest would begin reading the book and Lewis would be sitting in the, on the sofa across the way and then the guest would stop and from memory C.S. Lewis would continue. Every book in his library. This, this, is, this is greatness of extraordinary proportion. You just don't run across this kind of greatness very often. The greatness of C.S. Lewis is a pittance compared to the greatness of Jesus. And John could be content with who he was because he was utterly confident of who Jesus was. Now, why don't more Christians talk like this? Turn with me, if you would, to Philippians. We're not going to come back to John. Philippians chapter 3, verse 4. There are other biblical characters who have spoken like John. You know, he must become greater, I must become less. A man can receive nothing except that which is given him from heaven. We know Paul. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. Jeremiah was being hassled and he said, thinking about what, what he should do, he said, but if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. 
Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. Whatever was proper to me before, I now consider loss. Why do people talk like this? And how can we have more of a heart, more of a passion for Jesus? Well, look what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 4 and following. He says, though I myself have reasons for such confidence in the flesh... He goes on, if anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But, but, he says. Whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. The problem, I believe, we're getting to the nugget here, okay? Of this, of this talk this morning. The root of the matter is the reason that we often are not able to experience this kind of contentment, say these kinds of things, is because we have put confidence in the flesh. Let me tell you how this happens. If there was one word that I could strike well, there would be more than one. But one word I would definitely like to strike from our Christian vocabulary is the word commitment. We ask men, have you made a commitment to Jesus? Would you like to make a commitment to Jesus? Are you committed to Jesus? But let me tell you what this sets up. Now, the word commitment is a legal word, okay? I'm not saying you can't use this word. I'm just saying I don't like it, and I'm going to tell you why. It's a legal word, but here's the problem with the word commitment. When you say, I'm committed to Jesus, it sets up a type of transactional Christianity where I do something, and then God does something. I'm committed to God. I'm doing what I can do, and it does often set up a subtle expectation that he owes me something in return. And I have seen this over and over and over again work out, and it creates theological inaccuracy. And you know how devoted we are here to theological accuracy. Now, the word commitment's a legal word, but I think the problem is is that a better word would be the word surrender. In other words, we should be asking men, have you surrendered your life to Christ? Are you leading a surrendered life? And the idea of surrender leads to transformational Christianity. Commitment, what I do for God, Surrender what God does for me. Commitment, a transactional Christianity. Surrender, a transformational Christianity. Now, because this is the first time you've heard this from me, I've been building up to this. You take it, you play with it, and see if this not be true. Again, I'm not saying that the word commitment is an illegal idea. It's not. But just ask yourself, when you talk about being committed to Jesus, is, does it in any way set up this subtle expectation that God owes you something, that there's some merit, that, that there's something you're contributing 
Because that would, that would mean that we're not saved by grace anymore. If you have anything in you that makes it worthwhile on your part for God to do something to save you, then if you have any merit, then we don't need Jesus. We don't, we don't need Jesus if you can keep the law. You can be righteous if you can earn salvation. Well, I don't think there's a man in this room at the end of the day would want to receive what he deserved. I mean, pray tell. Is there anybody in here so dull at the end of any given day that they would want to actually receive what they really deserve? I want grace. I want mercy. So, here's, here's a great secret of contentment. And it's to move from commitment to surrender. It's to move in our thinking from commitment to Jesus to surrender to Jesus. I believe this is a I believe this is one of the biggest ideas we're ever going to talk about here. The idea that true contentment results when we move from commitment, thinking of our faith as commitment. To surrender. Now, the irony of surrender is that it ends not in defeat, but victory. Oftentimes, unfortunately, when you make commitments, I'm going to do this, I'm going to keep that, I'm going to go there, you can count on me. You don't keep them, right? You break them. That's the problem with commitment. Is you can't keep those commitments. You're not going to keep those commitments. We need grace. And we receive grace by surrendering our lives to the Lord Jesus. Now, just in my own case, you know, I'm a, a little dull on occasion and have been known to be a slow learner on occasion. Actually, I'm not a slow learner. I'm a pretty quick learner. I just don't like to do what I'm told to do. And so, when I became a Christian, I became committed to Jesus. That was my deal. I was committed to, to Christ. Very committed to Christ. You would never have met a more committed person. The problem is, is that I had an agenda. Some things I wanted to happen. And so suddenly, now looking back, it's pretty easy to see. Hindsight's 2015, a little better than 2020. And Looking back, I can see very clearly that suddenly, what I tried to do is I tried to work God. Guess what? Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Who got worked? Yeah, got worked over. So I was trying to read my Bible for comfort and my Forbes for direction. <laughs> and I was trying to get this plan worked out. And I found that God has dealt with me in three different ways when I am clinging to an idol. When I'm not being a living sacrifice. You know the problem with living sacrifices, don't you? They crawl off the altar. And put their hands back on these idols. Whether it's money or prestige, or even a spouse. I mean, anything. It can be anything. A Harley Davidson, crying out loud. You can make anything into an idol. And here's what the Lord, because his, his grace is so wonderful, and it is the sharpest razor edge knife you'll ever experience. You know that. So here's the, here are the three ways that, that he deals with me. The first way is when I'm wanting an idol, he will withhold something that I think I can't live without. And you all have experienced this. You probably have some things right now that you think that you absolutely can't live without this thing. You probably have something like this. Ha, 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 ha. Uh, just, uh, <clears throat> You may have something right now that you think that you absolutely can't live without. And because God loves you so much, he will not let you have that. 
And that's grace. Sorry. Don't shoot me. I'm just the messenger here. The second way God has dealt with me when I'm trying to cling on to something is that he will give me so much of it that I gag on it. And that happened. God gave me such incredible success in the, in the, in the 70s and 80s, which is what I wanted. That was my life. And, and I ended up gagging on it. I hated my life. I despised it. And the third way that God works with me, and I think with all of us, is that he will take away things that we think we can't live without. And I've had that happen, and you've had that happen, but men, why is God doing this? Why does God do that to you? Why does he do it to me? Well, often he's not the one doing it. There are wicked, evil people out there doing wicked, evil things. And a lot of times, other people are doing it to us. It's not him. But he lets it happen. So sometimes he causes it. Other times he allows it. Why does he do this, men? He does this because of his indescribable love. And his desire to perfect you, he would much rather cut off your leg than have it turn gangrene and kill your whole body. And so his knife cuts deep into the flesh of your soul. And it's painful. Why does he do it? Because he's trying to drive us from commitment to surrender. He doesn't want you to be committed. If you're only committed to Jesus, I'm willing to bet that you're not fully committed to Jesus. If you can't think in your mind, I surrender all to you, Jesus then you may not be what you think you are. All right, well, how do we get there? The secret of contentment is to move from being committed to surrender. I want to give you three quick ideas. They're in the scripture. I said we weren't going back to John. You can go back and look at them later. But the knowledge of God. If you want to move from commitment to surrender, to, to surrender, acquire the knowledge of God. That's what, that's what moved John to be able to say, he must become greater, I must become less. When he understood the character of God, the nature of God, his grace, his mercy, his love, his sovereignty, his holiness, his awesome power. And the second thing to do is to surrender your life. To release yourself with no reserves to Jesus. And I think the third thing is to accept your place in life. You know, if you're not content where you are right now, guess what? You're not going to be content where you want to be. Let me say that again. If you are not content where you are, you're not going to be content where you want to be. Another secret of contentment is that it's not so much getting what we want, it's wanting what we get. And the way to move there, men, is to move to a surrender to the Lordship of Jesus in our lives. To be able to say, Lord, have your own way with me. Stop trying to get out of it. Go through it. That's the deal. The refiner's fire is the grace of God. Now, I wrote this on the way out the door this morning. I'm going to ask us all to repeat it. Let me say it once, and then let's repeat it. I am what I am by the grace of God. 
You know that's true. Would you say that with me? I am what I am by the grace of God. I am what I am by the grace of God. As we close, some of you may want to uh, do, do a little business with the Lord here. You may want to consider this idea of moving from commitment to surrender. And so for those of you who would like to do that, I'd like to invite you to join me in, in prayer, and I'll lead us in a time of prayer as we close. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, when we look at the life of John, we're astonished at how embarrassing and content he was with his life. And Lord, we see that it's because he, he had confidence that you are who you say you are. Lord, we, we have that confidence, too. We want more confidence. And Father, a lot of us have been living in a Christian culture here in the United States that has stressed a commitment to you. But we, we've sometimes we get this turned around, Lord, and we, we think of it as something we're doing to make you happy and to earn some merit with you. And Lord, just help us to understand that you're already happy with us. <laughs> and we don't need any merit because of Jesus. He has paid the price for everything. Lord, some of us have been beat up by grace. It's been brutal. Your love has been fierce and your mercy has been unrelenting. We have had things withheld. We have had things removed and we have gagged on a number of things, Lord. And Lord, Part of this is because we've been committed but not surrendered. And so some of us, Lord, want to move from mere commitment in the sense we've been talking about it to a true surrender to your Lordship. And if that is your desire and you would like to do that, let me just invite you, pray this prayer to yourself silently after me. Lord Jesus, I realize that my motives have not been completely pure, that I've been a little off because of this idea of I've done something for you through commitment, expecting you to do something back for me. And I realize this is wrong, and I ask you to change my thinking and change my believing. And then Jesus, I surrender all. Would all of you say that with me? I surrender all. Amen. Hold your seats for just a moment, if you would. First time visitors, uh, welcome to you. I'd like to ask you, invite you to join me at the first time visitors table in the front right hand corner of the building. For those of you who have made this full, total, complete surrender of your life this morning to the Lordship of Christ. Remember, it's by grace. You're going to walk out of here and do what? Fall. So just get back up again and just keep surrendering and resurrendering your life. Uh, it's a pilgrimage. It's a journey. And uh, now, does this mean that you don't need to be committed? Live out the surrender that leads to commitment. Don't try to live out the commitment that you think will eventually lead to surrender. Make sense? Let's break to the tables. Second time is for John. Is